At this point, we're getting this concept that we have a page one and a page two. We defined a header, a footer, an article. We used data roles or class and role to then define the various blocks or sections of the screen. And this is starting to come together. We've got this header, we've got this footer, it's starting to look like an app. We'll be able to put our logo at the top, we'll be able to put a nav bar and all of that cool stuff that will define a mobile project. Now before we go further, if you go to back to page two, that still looks plain as when we started an hour ago. The drawback is that this is not inherited. We wrote the data role and all of that stuff on page one, but page two has none of that styling. We never wrote it. So one way to do this is to create your section with your header and your article and your footer, and then copy and paste it multiple times and just simply change it. Because they're all data roles page, they're all data roles footer, they're all roles main. But what changes is the ID, page one, page two. Home, about, contact, con contact. So I'm not going to sweat it just uh, at the moment too much that my section is still going to look really plain. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste section one perhaps to improve upon it. There's other things I want to mention first. Notice heading one. Uh, existed here in page 2 and page 1. That is valid because they are separate sections. Normally I had said, you know, there's one section, there's one page 1 only. Well, that would make sense uh, when I've got one document like this. There's my heading 1 at the top. Nothing else should be heading 1. It's one document. Well, I've got one document and I've got another document. Section, data roll page section data roll page. It's its own document. It's its own world. So I can use the heading one more than once. Separate it into different sections. That's why I have another heading one here. I have then on page one an H4 at the footer. Common practice doing it with jQuery mobile is that if you're using a footer, whatever footer text you have down there would be a heading four. So that means I can use heading two and three in the main article. So try to keep heading four reserved for any text in the footer. Keep heading one reserved for any text in the header. And then you can use heading twos and heading threes in the article. So inside of the article, h2, welcome. It's inside of the article, the main content area. After that, I can write a plain old paragraph and say something like, uh, this is my first jQuery mobile project. I've learned. just some quick bullet points. That's, that's nothing new. There's a paragraph with some text. There's another paragraph with bullet points. There's some bullet points. Just writing something. You don't have to do it exact. Just I'm writing something. I'm writing some content. So the main content of your site is in the article, is what I'm getting at. Header has a purpose, footer has a purpose. Then the main content is in the article. 
any content can go here. Headings, paragraphs, bullet points, images, videos, sounds, etc. That's just a little content I'm filling in, just to look at something. <coughs> Let's say I had a really small screen like this. <coughs> if I scroll down, I see my content. I'm also seeing my header scrolling away. My footer is fixed. It stays at the bottom. That's what I want but my header is scrolling away. You won't see that, of course, if you're maximized. There's nowhere to scroll. I have a screen that's very small like this, just to make it obvious. When I scroll, it scrolls away. Isn't there a way that I learned to fix the footer down? What if I use the same way to fix the header? What I'm getting at is we did data position fixed onto the footer, do or add data position fix to the header to prevent it from scrolling away. Copy and paste. We saw that data position sticks it to the bottom. Data position fix added to the header will stick it to the top. How does it know to stick one to the bottom and one to the top? Well, footer and header. And somewhere in the CSS code it says, wherever you see a data position fixed, and it's inside of a footer, stick it to the bottom. And whenever you see a data position fixed inside the header, stick it to the top. So we don't need to know exactly how it works, we just need to know how to use it. So back to the header, data position fixed. And that will prevent your header from scrolling away. You may want that aesthetic, that style of it scrolling away, that's fine. But I'm showing you here, commonly you're in the Facebook app, you're in the Instagram app, and some header or footer is always there. Well, you fix it, or else it'll scroll away, the default behavior. And you will see that most obviously if you've made this a really small screen, I scroll, it doesn't go away. There's also a built-in behavior here that if I'm scrolled somewhere, I click or I tap, imagine this will be on a device eventually, those headings and footers also disappear. <coughs> like if I'm at the very top and I click inside, the footer disappears. If I'm at the very bottom and I click inside, the header disappears. That would be a way that if you've got some content to show and your headers and footers are getting in the way, people can tap, they hide. That's built in. That can be overridden. I can permanently show them. That code I don't have memorized. I do have to look up. But this is automatic, yes. It won't be it won't be obvious when I maximize like this. Well, I guess a little bit kind of see it. But when I have a smaller screen, it's built in, yes. This button that I've made, go to page two, it's got a couple of other things that I can do, a couple of other attributes. Um, let's find our button again. It's on mine, it's on line 26. We have data role, data icon, data theme. Let's add this other attribute. Data dash inline equals true. Right now, the remember we had inline level elements and block level elements. A block level element took up all of the space on its line and pushed the other things down. 
bullet points automatically do that. A list item pushes the next list item down. It's a block level element. Buttons here by default are block level elements. Now we're saying the opposite via jQuery mobile. Data inline true. Make this a an inline level element so that it doesn't push the other elements away and it also shrinks down to only be the size of the text inside. That's how I can fit two buttons side by side. If I have two buttons side by side and they don't and they're not set to data inline true, one button will push down another button. It wants to take up a whole block, a whole line. Data inline true will let them coexist on one line. Just to show you there. Say that again. Exactly. That's what I just did here very quickly. You don't have to do this. I copied and pasted. Go to page three. There's no page three, but I made a new button. They're both set to true. They exist on one line. If these did not have the inline true, if I set them to false, which is their opposite. Each one takes up its own line, pushes the other one down. So sometimes that has a value that has a use, data inline true or false. False is the default, true is the opposite. If I never wrote data inline false, it's the same as if it was false, and it does it, block level element. Data inline true forces it to inline level element. Data dash transition equals. We can apply one of six built-in animations, and we can define our own. It's kind of complex, but we could. Data transition. Right now, we have a basic one built-in called fade. We can do one called flip. This will make an animation. When you click the button to go from page one to page two, it will flip in between. Save it and run it. Click the button. You will see it flip. When you press back, it'll flip back. Built-in animation. Forward and back. Data transition. We The built-in one is fade, and we're doing flip, and I'll mention a couple of others in a moment. But I'm just saying that it flips when you go forward and it flips when you come back. Let's see. That's a mixture of jQuery and CSS. HTML has no built in way to animate. CSS can animate and jQuery, JavaScript can animate. So I don't know how it animates, I just know data roll flip or data transition flip and it flips. So what I do here when I click, it flips. I press back, it flips back. Now by now, you may be seeing, what's that text floating behind everything? I see text for a moment and then it disappears. What is that? It's our H1. It's our H1 that we've ignored that doesn't exist in any element. This that we wrote a while ago is not in a section, it's not in a header, a footer, it's not in an article, it's nowhere, and therefore it puts it behind everything. <clears throat> Take it out. Any elements should exist in a section, in a footer, in an article, in, in a proper container. Yes, we could move that somewhere to a proper container. <coughs> that was superfluous. Just delete that line. Delete your line that we wrote a while ago, the jQuery mobile intro. Just delete that, or comment it out if you want. You shouldn't then see that mystery text appear for a moment. Now it doesn't exist. Data transition flip, we have a slide. Slide is one. This is going to slide over. We have these six built-in ones, 
and on every button we can add a different animation if we want, but we shouldn't. Just like with fonts, we have 800 fonts to choose from. Let me choose seven. No, I might want to choose two. I want to keep it simple. I could have five transitions on every button I make. No, then it'll look disjointed, unprofessional. You want to keep the number of transitions low, like one or two, or else it'll look amateurish and disorienting. Slide up. One word, no space. Slide up. The list of all of these is on the jQuery website, which we will look at together in a moment. You can write it down or just wait till we look at the documentation, but I'll show one more. This is the most interesting one. It's very extravagant. Flow. Data transition flow. Check out what that one does. <coughs> so flow it's as if I flicked the screen out of the way. I tapped it and flicked it out of the way. It's like a slide and a shrink and a move, and it's really interesting. Behind the scenes, it's some CSS and some JavaScript, and my content flows. We have a way to quickly create nav bars. Nav bars. We can quickly uh, create a top or bottom nav bar with a variety of links up there uh, that will take us from screen to screen. This is a button and it works, but what might be better is a nav bar. The nav bar should be at the top of the screen, so in what element might be a good idea to put it into? <coughs> header, yeah. Let's put our links, our nav bar. It's back up to the header. Page one, I'll call it home. This is what will appear first. After heading one, nav. We have a nav tag that will encompass um, links. This has a data role. Nav bar. One word, lowercase, no space. So some of them are very obvious to remember. Header is header. Footer is footer. Article, that's one of the hardest ones to remember because you need the role and the class. And nav is close. Nav Navbar. As we saw when we created the Marvel blog, the navbar was a list, was a bullet pointed list, a collection of links. So, unordered list. A list item home. A list item about list item contact. We know that list items, bullet points, are going to be block level elements taking up their own space. Right there. But when you've got list items, bullet points, in a nav with a data roll of nav bar, they automatically become inline. We wrote that manually previously. We did header, space, nav, space, li, display inline. We do it all manually ourselves in here. Pretty automatic. We just need to know the right 
short code, the right shortcut. It's dividing up the top area into three columns. These are not links yet. They're not active, that is. I can't click on them yet. They need links. A tag. href to somewhere. A tag. href attribute to somewhere. A tag href somewhere. So we wrap an a tag around inside of the list item. The list item should be the outermost element. It's a block level element. A tags are inline level. Inline elements are often in a block level, not the opposite. To the block level because it pushes this link down there. And then these are inline. We get that. Once we have the A tag in there, somewhere the CSS is triggered so that you have equidistant columns, centered borders around it, rollovers. href pound home, href pound about, href pound contact. Keep these links simple. If you're linking to some other section or some other file, if I'm on the home.html file and I link to the Spider-Man file, the easiest way to call it is Spider-Man.html, not spider capital dash man dash the date dash html. Keep it simple. It'll be simpler for you because it's less to type, less to remember. If this link was called contact us, I would still call this contact. It's less to type. It's less to make a mistake about. At the moment these links won't work because this is saying when you click on home go to a section called ID equals home. When you click on about, it means go to a section called ID equals about. My home section is called page one. Well, if home is supposed to take me to home, just because I called it home doesn't mean it works. It works with the proper ID. Pound home to take me to my home section. So rewrite your page 1 ID, line 11, to be home without the pound sign. The pound sign shows up on the link, but not in the ID. Page 2 could serve as a good um, about page, but I've called page 2 <coughs> page 2. I should call page 2 ID about. That's what my link is saying. Up here. So I'm on the home screen, I click about, go to page 2. This, yes, good point. This will now be broken. The button that originally existed here, there's no more page two. So yes, you would want to fix that as well. So on line 33, there's no more page two. There's, no, there's nothing more called ID equals page two. We called it about. So fix that as well.
this was a plain old link and up on the nav bar technically is a plain old link but because that link is in a list item which is in the nav it behaves like a nav bar this one we had to add data role we didn't have to add data role button because it's inside of the element that it expects a nav bar data role <coughs> but we still can add an icon change the theme and a transition so to the ahref on about, well, we'll do each one. On the home, data dash icon, home, on the about, data dash icon, um, info, data dash icon, email. mail, not email, mail. If it's uh, one that it doesn't recognize, it'll just be empty. So an icon automatically set to the top. We saw down here the icon is automatically set to the left. Well, again, because we've got a list item in a nav bar, it knows to put the icon at the top. We can move it to the bottom, to the left, wherever we want, with a little more code. But the default here is that the icon appears at the top. If we did want the icon below the text, we have data dash icon pos, pos, position, bottom. You have to do it to all of them. Well, that might not be the right code. Never mind. I have to look that one up. I'll just ignore that one for the moment. We we do have a way to force it to the left or the right or the, or the bottom. I have to look it up. But here I've added icons. We have those 50 built-in ones. And maybe I have uh, some link that's called high score. Maybe I'm making a game and I want to go see my high score. I don't have an icon built in to delineate high score, perhaps. I can make up my own icons. We'll see how to do that later. But out of the 50 built-in ones, I might find the right one. And the thing that these are very common ones. There's one for home to take me back home. Info could be for about. Some of these, like gear, does that make sense in my case? High score with a gear. You, you may see it as a sun. I, I see it as a gear. But perhaps that doesn't make sense. That icon doesn't make sense with the text. And then we get into the whole discussion about pictographics and all of that. But these have a meaning. Whenever we see the little house, it often means that's your home screen. If we see that little I for info, that probably means some kind of information about something. The gear, that makes me think settings. So settings, that makes sense. Now, picture-wise and text-wise, it makes sense. And I'm not going to find an icon. Maybe I want an icon of a, of a little spaceship for the high score. There's no spaceship icon, but I can design one myself and then add it in CSS later. <coughs> and then the transition, um, data dash transition. Each of these has the has the built-in um, fade. To each one I would add, I could add a separate one. I'll make home flip, and I'll make about flow, and I'll make settings slide up. No, you want the same one for all three. Because conceptually, you're going to break people's expectations. 
when you use an app, and we'll have a deeper discussion about user experience later, but the user experience dictates you want to give the user a good experience. You want them to use your app, make it make sense for them when they click a button, make it behave how they expect, because after now in the year 2017, some of us have had 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years using computers. And we have these expectations of how things behave. We've learned it over time. When we break people's expectations, why is there a gear setting on the home button? We break these expectations, we break user experience. And that's annoying for people. More annoyance causes then people to stop using your app or complain and give you bad reviews. So eventually when we talk about our real app and all of that, that's a deeper discussion we'll have. User experience, graphic design, color combinations and color choices. This class is not only going to focus on write the right code to make it work. We're going to need to talk a little bit about eventually designing your own graphics. You may not be a graphics person. A lot of times people coming to this programming class are not graphic designers. That's fine. I'll show you a lot of resources and tools and shortcuts to make visually interesting things. You don't have to be a pro at that, but you do have to be somewhat knowledgeable if you're making your own app from beginning to end from scratch, as most of us here want to do that. That means you need to know how to program it so that it works, how to graphic design it so that it works visually, how to make your icons and logos and texts, so spell check. We need to take care of all of that stuff if we are our own app developer. If we're working with a team, we'll let the graphic designer deal with the colors. I'll deal with the code. But if you are your own app studio, you're going to deal with it all in this class. So I'm just getting at that don't go crazy with a lot of transitions. It's odd for people. Why did that screen flip and this one flowed? You're breaking expectations. If I'm making a pop-up screen, maybe I do want a different animation for that. But if I'm going from screen to screen to screen, same animation. Consistency. One of the four tenets of graphic design. Consistency. So here, about, it flips. I'm already on home, so I'm on home. Uh, I, it would look nice if I had that nav bar on page two, and we will put it, we'll do a little copy and paste in a moment. Question. We do, uh, on the next version of jQuery Mobile, from, from the previews that I've looked at, they're going to make it a lot easier that you don't have to redo it every time. But for the moment, with version 1.4, the short answer is that yes, you want to put this nav bar on every screen. So if I write it one time, copy and paste it. And there is another way to do another kind of nav bar with JavaScript that is a little too complex that I want to get to now. But there are ways to save effort. <coughs> For the moment, a little copy and paste. So I'm building this first screen. And this may be enough of a sort of a placeholder template for my about screen and my settings screen, or whatever you, th you, whatever you called your third one. That means this section here, page two, just delete it. Because I'm going to copy and paste this complete section, which has a header, and a footer, and an article, and a nav bar. And based on that, I can make my About section, About screen, my Settings screen. I'm going to copy, I'm going to select and copy from slash section back to section, that whole chunk from about line 11 to about line 39. All of that that we created, all of that complete screen, copy and paste twice. I'm going to give myself an extra space there. So from 11 to 40, so I've got 30 lines, 
copied and pasted twice. So what you want to do is to repeat, you want to select your section completely. So to confirm, you click where it starts, make sure then you select from there all the way to where it ends. Copy it and then paste it and paste it again. So at about, in my case, at about line 39, the home section ended. That might be a good point to add a comment. End of home section. That slash section ended the home section. Section data roll page ID about. So I copied and pasted it once. Section ID about. Copied and pasted it a third time. Section ID equals contact or whatever you called your third link. <coughs> In my case, down on line 69, this is the end of my about section. Third section each needs a unique identifier. Contact. So I, I did something funny. I called the button visually settings. But my code is linking to pound contact. So either way you want to resolve that. I'm keeping the link contact. I'm calling it contact. Yes, my button visually will say settings. I can fix that later. I think that's an easier way to fix this. I was just freestyling and thinking of things to write there. I should have kept the contact. Hopefully you kept the contact. Doesn't matter. You can fix it. In my section of contact, just to make it obvious, heading one, contact. In my section of about, H1 about. So you see a section is a complete screen and right now we have three copies of the exact same screen. I'm just changing the heading ones per screen to make them make sense. In the about section I called it about. In the contact section I called it contact. If I save it and run it, I get uh, my home screen. I click About. Everything looks exactly the same except for the H1 where I wrote About. I click on Settings slash Contact, and it goes to Contact. Everything's exactly the same except for the H1. I click on Home goes back home. So this way is not perfect. Every screen looks exactly the same, but every screen is structurally the same, which is more important at this point, perhaps. Sections, headers, articles, footers, navs. And then I can populate the content.
what I want to do is um, look at the official documentation. If this didn't quite work, we will, we will do the help in a moment. Mm -hmm. But I want to look at the official documentation and uh, see what other features we have. Then we'll stop the lecture and then we'll have the grading period and the lab time. <coughs> so if it worked great, if not, that's okay. Uh, for the moment, go to your web browser. Actually, I want to look at one thing first. Go over to Wikipedia. Open up a separate web browser. Go to wikipedia.org. And search at the bottom of the article, jQuery Mobile. W-I-K-I-P-E-D-I-A, wikipedia.org and search jQuery Mobile. jQuery Mobile is a touch-optimized web framework, also known as a mobile framework, more specifically a JavaScript library currently being developed by the jQuery project team. The development focuses on creating a framework compatible with the wide variety of smartphones and tablet computers, made necessary by the growing but heterogeneous tablet and smartphone market. <coughs> The jQuery mobile framework is compatible with other mobile app frameworks and platforms such as PhoneGap, Worklight, and more. So let's say this is a JavaScript file, basically, and it allows you to create touch-optimized, mobile device-friendly projects that also work well with PhoneGap slash Cordova or Ionic or Angular or React or all of these great other frameworks to quickly create advanced projects. Uh, it's been uh, worked on since 2010. It keeps uh, improving and it's very popular. You can go to the main website in a moment. What does it do? It's compatible with all devices. So basically we're learning this because we're going to use this as one of our tools eventually to create a, a, a full mobile app. Um, a quick way to create the nav bars and the buttons and the transitions and all of that. We could use what we learned on the first two weeks and then with Cordova, which we'll get to next month, then turn that project into a real Android or iPhone app. We could also go this route using jQuery mobile, using that as a way to create the Marvel blog or uh, you know Snapchat 2.0 or whatever app I want to create with this or other ways. Um, some examples here, which uh, we're not going to get to just yet, but some ways using jQuery for JavaScript to make a pop-up happen, uh, to an make an animation, animation of things sliding down, more behind-the-scenes information, and then this example code right here should look a little familiar. We typed all of this together, basically. So from this article, we created this. We actually did a little bit more than what is here. This one doesn't have the example of the of the nav bar. We did that beyond. It goes on to tell you more about data themes and colorizing it and all of that. Mobile support, it works on all of these platforms, some you've never heard of, lots of places. The development release way back in 2010, it was alpha version 1, going on and on, <coughs> latest version. And what I like about Wikipedia is then you can go off to learn more. Well, PhoneGap, that's something we're going to look at in month two. PhoneGap, also known as Cordova. You can educate yourself before we get to that next month. But PhoneGap basically is a way to package any web project so that it works natively on any device. We're getting ahead of ourselves. You can look at that. And also one more little thing just to show off. If you, look, if you look at the view history of this article at the very top right corner, you will see that I've been contributing to this article, helping improve it. And just to show off, I'm famous on Wikipedia. Yes? Yes. Yes. Um, 
when we when we get to it, we'll see. But this chart right here shows you with PhoneGap, writing some JavaScript, we will be able to access the camera of any device. We don't need to know the specific Java code for Android, and then we don't need to learn the specific Objective C code for iPhone and the specific C sharp code for Windows. We just write one JavaScript command, PhoneGap, aka Cordova, then converts it to the native code of each platform. And that's all in month two. Yes. So we're still working with the basic concepts of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We have more to learn. We're going to uh, focus on this uh, more next week in that we're going to start to put together an idea for a project, start to build the various screens, still learning about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then in month two, learn more of the JavaScript, start to deploy it, learn how to deploy it to real devices as a real app, not just a website then get advanced in part three about databases, publishing it, putting it on a real app store, publicizing it, version, releasing version two, the whole enchilada. Part one is focused on the basic structure, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And jQuery Mobile will be a way to quickly start to create our basic structure. The content is still up to us. You know, sometimes, rarely, but people say, that's cheating, it already made the buttons for you, I want to write that manually. Go ahead, you're still able to. <laughs> but with jQuery Mobile, with Ionic, with so many other uh, starting points, you know, Bootstrap and all of this, it's a way to get started quickly. I don't want to write this code over and over. I just want to write data roll equals page and fill in my content and write the button to take a photo and save the photo to the database. I want to move past the interface. I want to make it do something. So we're going to spend time on jQuery Mobile. So let's go over to jQueryMobile.com. The weekend is coming up. I would recommend browse jQuery Mobile on your own. The full documentation is here. How does this work exactly in a beginner level and in an advanced level? A touch-optimized web framework. jQuery Mobile is an HTML5-based user interface system designed to make responsive websites and apps that are accessible on all smartphones, tablets, and desktop devices. It doesn't matter what type of device a person visits on, because then our interface will adapt per device. Behind the scenes, it's all HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We just need to know the right data role. It's not always data role. Sometimes it's data role, data transition. What else is there? Data rel. There's other <coughs> ones. They're all listed here. Let's look at demos. Look at the demos here. This is like the, <coughs> the beginner's screen, and here's the advanced screen. Let's look at the beginner screen first. We're using the current version, 1.4.5. You can go look at 1.0. We'll just focus on 1.4.5. This site itself is made in jQuery Mobile. So if you look behind the scenes also at their code, you're going to see data roles and all of the stuff that we did, uh, stuff we haven't done yet, like data-ajax and ui.block for columns and all that cool stuff. But here then is a way, well, how do I make pages? How do I make navigations? Forget that. I want to know the icons. If you scroll down to the CSS framework area or on the left somewhere there, Let's look at icons. Let's look at all possible icons. Let's look at how to make my own icons. It's under here. A set of built-in icons in jQuery Mobile can be applied to buttons, collapsible elements, list view elements, and more. There is an SVG and ping image of each icon. By default, the SVG is used, which is high quality. So right here's a list of all of them. If I wanted to use the calendar, how do you think I use it? data-icon equals calendar. If you want to make sure, all of these have view source. So if I want to make my own icon, there's no skull icon built in. View source <coughs> will tell you how to do it. This one's a little more complex. You have to write some HTML 
something like this, my icon, then you have to write some CSS. My icon, etc. Background image, etc. So to make your own icons, it's a little more complex. I recommend you play with it. We'll do it later. But we need to write some HTML and some CSS because we're inventing that skull icon that doesn't exist. If you want to use one that exists, we have, for example, search. Maybe in my app, I want to search the database. There's an icon for a magnifying glass. That would work perfectly fine. If I have other icons I want to use, like from Font Awesome or these other ones, there's a way to do that as well. Read the documentation. <coughs> Positioning. You will see as you browse, sometimes you'll see data-something. That itself also is a shorthand. The longhand is like this, class, data dash, data dash role equals button is the same as UI button, space UI shadow, space UI corner all, space UI icon arrow, space UI button icon bottom. All of that is the long, long way of writing data role equals button, data icon equals arrow. Sometimes we need to write the long way for various reasons. And the documentation tells you both ways. Just read the documentation. For example, what if I only want an icon? Use no text as the value of icon position to create an icon only button. So there's a link. I could do it this way. Data icon position <coughs> equals no text or the long way. If I go back to the main area and search for transitions, fade, pop, flip, these are the ones built in. To make your own, it's going to tell you how, but it's pretty complex. One of these six or seven here might do the trick. We haven't gotten to this one yet, but we can also make dialog pop-up boxes. We've made page screenfuls of content. Sometimes we need a pop-up that appears like this. We haven't done that one yet. We can view the code, the documentation, how to do that. We will do it together eventually. You can get a heads up here. Other things we'll do, like um, collapsible sets, and list views. But you see this many times in apps. A row of selectable elements. Something like this. We can do this. We will do this eventually. I want to select possible options. Give them icons, transitions, rollovers. We will see this eventually. Data roll list view. We'll get to that. We can do easily filtering things. So we've got all of these possibilities. As I start typing C, it filters it down to the C's, R's, only that. How do we do that? It's listed right there. Data roll list view, data filter, true. And it builds it in a searchable system out of your bullet points. We can then populate these dynamically via JavaScript from the database, much more advanced later. But these are the building blocks to create something powerful, quickly. To create this search functionality in JavaScript, it's dozens of lines of code. Data roll, list view, data filter, true, done. The opposite, data reveal. If I start searching CR, it searches my list of elements and it shows the relevant one. This one's a little more complex. There's a form, there's a data role, there's a filter, data filter reveal, true. The weekend is coming up. It's a long weekend. You may want to browse this a bit. Together we will use the various tools and widgets here to start to create an interface with an idea for an app. Together, we're going to focus on creating a certain app. I recommend, however, on the side, 
for you to think about an app project as well. You don't have to quite think of that just yet. I want to start to focus on like a common app for us to do it together, to be on the same track, and then you can start to refine it to your own idea, or at the same time work on your idea and the class project as the time goes on. You want to change, like for example, one of the interfaces? Can you do two different CSS? Yes, okay. we'll also do that. Like uh, maybe class or like ID? classes and okay. IDs. Exactly. If we had one of these uh, list views mm -hmm. and we don't like how it looks, we can definitely rewrite classes and IDs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you can do Basically this. For uh, JavaScript focused on mobile. Okay. So that's jQuery Mobile. Um, we're going to take uh, a break, or actually, we're going to end up the main lecture. Uh, I'll put my code of this uh, jQuery file in the network folder, but it's coming from the J from the Wikipedia article. We'll do some lab time, but I'm going to go first through uh, grading this stuff, and then I'll help you individually if you need it. That's it for the moment. When we come back next time, we'll start to focus on an app idea, start to put together the foundation, get more complex. So.